Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to another Squawk Talk program after a little bit of a hiatus uh, for various reasons across the summer. And I'm delighted to be uh, joined tonight by my colleague from Sources, Tally Bonnie Craven. And then we have, uh, working clockwise around the screen, we have Neil Findlay, former MSP, uh, joining us, I guess, from Scotland, Neil, uh, to talk about his book, If You Don't Run, They Can't Chase You, uh, stories from the front line in the fight for social justice. And uh, by Unite's Howard Beckett on what has been a, a quite dramatic uh, day in the story of the union in terms of the uh, general secretary election. And uh, I promise I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be as nice as I can be on that and uh, and let you guys do most of the talking. So um, if it's OK, we'll lead in on the uh, on the Unite election. Uh, Sharon Graham is the um, what would you call it? the general secretary in waiting pending the uh, official confirmation of the results tomorrow. Uh, but the, the count seems to be all but done. And uh, as I understand it, Steve Turner has conceded in that contest. I uh, don't know about Gerard Coyne, but he's said to be quite a way behind. Um, uh, so Unite will have its first woman general secretary. Um, as Neil mentioned just before the show, we now have the two biggest unions in the country with uh, both led by women uh, and uh, not necessarily the women, <laughs> or at least in some cases where you might want to see them in that position. However, you know, it's still a significant, uh, significant moment. And um, Howard, we'll got you first seen as, uh, well, I think we're all union members here, but you you work for the union and oh, we've lost him. He's been having some technical problems on and off all the way through the prep. Uh, so, Neil, let's get, let's give you a shout first off as a, as a Unite member and former uh, member of Scottish Parliament. Tell us what uh, what what this means to uh, Unite up in, in Scotland there. Um, well, thanks first of all for having us on, Steve and Bonnie. It's, uh, it's great to join you tonight. Um, I think it has been a bit of a momentous and dramatic day. Um, I don't think many people, uh, other, other than possibly uh, those within Sharon Graham's campaign, saw, saw this coming. And, uh, you know, first of all, I would say um, congratulations to Sharon Graham for winning the contest. I think it's uh, uh, that's the right thing to do, irrespective of which candidate you supported. Although I have to say I would have... Um, I was uh, uh, choked on my vomit had uh, um, uh, Mr. Coyne won the election. But, um, you know, I think it's right to congratulate Sharon on winning that election. Um, she clearly ran a very effective campaign. I don't know Sharon personally. Uh, I hope I will get to know her personally. Um, but uh, uh, she clearly ran a very effective campaign. Uh, and the membership responded in kind. And uh, um, that, I, I think... There's a lot to learn from the election. There's a lot to learn from uh, some of the, the policy initiatives, the, maybe the way in which the left was maybe, you know, a bit arguing with itself in the in the early days. I think there's lots to learn from that. But I think it's only right that we congratulate uh, the person who's victorious today. Um, Howard, well, we've got you because you've been having some in and out problems with the tech. Uh, then uh, tell us what... Um have you frozen again? Hi, not sure which of the Howard Beckett's is live. <laughs> oh, I can see one blinking. So uh, there we go, Howard. While we've got you, um, let's uh, let's get your comment on uh, on the results in the first place, uh, and we'll hopefully keep hold of you to uh, continue the discussion. Oh God, no. <laughs> going to be one of those nights it's been one of those days um right, let's take the stock Howard Beckett out of there and we'll put him back in when he comes back uh Bonnie uh give us your perspective on this you have a woman leading uh, leading the the biggest union in the UK and Ireland well I mean as the woman representing women on this panel I have to say that um obviously we at Socialist Telly went early for Howard um, we backed Howard, but I am, as a woman, I don't tend to play identity politics with people. I don't choose people on the basis of any any part of their identity. But as a woman working in the movement, I'm very, very pleased to hear that we've got another woman in a top flight position because in trade unionism and in politics, there are too many opportunities denied to women. So, so I guess you know we'll have to. I don't know enough about Sharon yet, but um, we have to make sure that women have a crack, fair crack of the whip going forward as well. Howard, are you uh, still functioning there? Can we get you in? Go quick before we lose you again. 
Um, Steve, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, you're coming through well. Can you hear me, Steve? My internet's, yes. uh, my internet's rubbish tonight, so my apologies. It's a, it's a mucky night in, in London. First of all, congratulations to Sharon. As Bonnie's correctly right. to have a woman as general tonight is tremendous. It's obviously a result that the right wing of the Labour Party did not want. Um, it's a reflection on Sharon's uh, campaign. She ran a very good campaign out there. And I'm sure that we'll all be able to come together now and unite under a manifesto to take Unite forward. Can you hear me, Steve? Yeah, you're yes. coming through loud and clear, mate. And we're, we're keeping the signal for the time being, which is good. I mean, let me put oh, something I'll, to you I'll, that, that came well, up. I'll, I'll continue with that. Yeah, let me let me just quickly put something to you then. I mean, you said that uh, this was a result that the right wing didn't want. They've tried to make out as though they do want this and they're quite relaxed about it. I've even seen reports uh, from, from certain tame... Oh, here we go. Hello, mate. We, I was going to ask, we, we, we've seen reports today from... Because uh, you said that the Labour Party is... The right wing of the Labour Party is not thrilled about, the, uh, about Sharon Graham's win. Um, but there, there have been, uh, reports from certain friendly, uh, you know, friendly to centrist journalists in the media today saying that the, the Labour right's happy about this and they're trying to blame you for Steve Turner's defeat. Um, and we're going to keep losing you again, over and over, I think. Um, could you hear that question, mate? Steve, I've turned the camera off. What, Neil, and why maybe the reception's a bit Yeah, turn the camera off and then at least we've got you, your voice, mate. You're coming through loud and clear. So, yeah, the Labour right was trying to blame you, you for Steve losing. Um, what's your what's your response to their uh, to that and to their um, media stenographers who've been reporting? Well, blame me for Steve losing. Yeah, the comment was that the Labour right, Starmer's office, was relaxed about Sharon Graham's win uh, and that uh, the reason that Steve Turner lost was that um, he was seen as too close to you, which, uh, you know, which was made me laugh out loud when I saw it because I was expecting something equally, uh, you know, similar amount of cheek and uh, disregard for reality coming out of it. But, you know, give us your take on that as the person who's the target of this nonsense. Well, it, it, it is obviously nonsense. The, the campaign that we had had a, a, a magnificent support and it would have been a support that will have turned out considerable amounts of vote for Steve. I think the thing that we can be absolutely certain of in a turnout of you know just over 120,000 with Jared Coyne getting 37,000 plus votes, that if there had been four on the ballot paper, Jared Coyne would have been favourite uh, to have won 37,000 votes whenever it split four ways. Uh, would have been a very difficult target to beat. And you can be fairly certain that not a single one of my supports would have gone to Jared Coyne whenever I pulled out. And you can be pretty certain not a single one of Jared Coyne's supporters was contemplating mm -hmm. voting for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I've just seen a, a comment popping up there from somebody saying that... Uh, Unite community is safe now. I mean, that's, again, something I wanted to bring up, which is, you know, Sharon Graham's campaign was pretty much all, looks like we're maybe losing Howard again, I'm not sure, uh, pretty much all about the workplace. And Unite has a community section of about 20,000 members who are not in the workplace. So what does, um, what, what does a Sharon Graham win mean for Unite community and what will you be doing to try and uh, help the members out there? Well, it's, Steve, I, I wouldn't be too bought into any narrative that Sharon's uh, win is, uh, is a detriment to the Unite community. Sharon understands the importance of the union within the community as well as it within the workplace. She had a clear, very clear election message, and that was one that was directed to organised workplaces. There's obviously a lot of votes in organised workplaces. The purpose of being in an election is, is to win. But I wouldn't, if I was a Unite community member, be fearful of what... Uh, Sharon Graham, General Secretary tenure means Sharon will embrace community members. She's a fighting back individual. She'll want to do good. And um, we've lost Howard again. It's going to be one of those nights. But uh, it certainly uh, sounds as though he's not concerned about the uh, about the future. 
uh, of uh, of the UNET community section. Um, I don't think we've got anybody in from UNET community on the program tonight. Usually, Diff Gamos with us. He's a he's a member of that. Um, but certainly, my experience of the community section has been that they're among the most kind of switched on and engaged members of the union. Um, Steve, can I say? And, can I say from my point of view? Yeah, go ahead. You know, I've worked for the Unite Community uh, branch in Scotland and the community organiser up here, Jamie Corbell, who some of the work they're doing has been fantastic on buses, uh, on community initiatives, campaigns in, in different communities across the country. And they, I think um, there's a, a lot of um, untapped potential there for the trade union movement. Um, a lot of very smart people uh, who... Um, you know, for whatever reason, find themselves out of work or unemployed, or you know, uh, or, or whatever, and they can they've got a lot to contribute, and it would be um, I think it'd be a detrimental move to um, uh, move backwards on the night community organising. And uh, Bonnie, have you had much to do with the community section? Uh, well, no, I'm I'm not. I'm a member of a trade union branch because I work for a different trade union. But I have to say that one of the things that I think is really positive about what looks like the results here is that the left are much, much stronger within Unite than a lot of people anticipated them being for, for the top three plate, the top. Yeah, the top two places to go to, to people on the left or people that were labelled as the left candidates, I think is really quite something because that says two thirds of the people who could be bothered bothered to vote want socialism and I'm I, you know that really warms me up I'm really pleased with that super um, I'm just seeing if we can get Howard in on a different route perhaps uh, oh there he is hi Howard um, just going to suggest there uh, if you can't uh, if you lose it again Steve. maybe try coming in through your phone See whether that will work any better. If you if you've got the mobile data, etc., it will. Uh, it may be a bit more um, amenable than the uh, than the Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, okay, so um, where next for the left then in this uh, in this? Now we've got that uh, the the unite leadership sorted out. How's that going to look, and how's that going to bear on what the left needs to do next? Because the original uh, reason we had Howard on the program and we've lost him again. Uh, was to talk about the uh, initiative that he's involved with, along with, I think, 16 left organisations to present a, a united front and a united resistance to what the Labour right's trying to do. Neil, I don't know if you have any any kind of contact or involvement with that. Well, I haven't, and uh, I would be, I would very happily be involved in that because I have to say, Stephen, uh, I think it is time for some frank talking amongst comrades that uh, at the moment uh, we seem pretty rudderless I know that the uh, that it's been a desperate situation since the uh, the, the demise of the Corbyn project. Um, the party's in a situation like I have never seen it in my thirty years of membership, uh, and that has been all through you know various you know Blair Brown uh, you know Kinnock, all of that. I think the party is in the worst state that I have ever seen it, and it is thoroughly thoroughly depressing. And what we really need at the moment is some leadership. Um, and that can be collective leadership. It can be individuals coming at the fore and showing some courage and determination to say we ain't going to allow this party to die. Because I think at the moment it is um, it is looking like it's it's in on its its deathbed, and uh, that that thoroughly depresses me. Um, it, it, there's not been a time I think in our recent history where. We need a, a, a progressive socialist Labour Party more when we look at the crises that are uh, across our communities, whether that be war and conflict, whether that be gross inequality, whether that be the situation with uh, refugee, you know, you name it. Every, the public services on their knees in Scotland as well as across the rest of the UK. And yet we see what we see uh, uh, the left in disarray, morale at rock bottom. And we're all sitting, looking at each other, saying, what are we going to do? Well, the only thing we can do is use our own initiative and our own uh, wherewithal to reorganise and rebuild. And I'll tell you what, all of these, these people who are shredding their membership cards need to have a, a, a wake-up call because that's exactly what they want us to do. They want us to shred our membership cards. They want us to walk away. Mm -hmm. 
and hand them over the reins of the party to do what they like with it. And we cannot allow that to happen. We cannot allow that to happen. And we have to organise and we have to rebuild. And look at what's happened today with a comrade like Ian, Ian Hodgson, who's a fantastic guy. I know him very well. I've campaigned with him. I've worked with him. Terrific guy. If that's what they're doing to people like Ian, God help us. God help us. But we won't help by walking away. We need to organise and rebuild. Uh, how do we lost you there briefly, but I was just uh, asking what, what next for the left now that we've got the Unite uh, leadership sorted out and how's the new landscape going to uh, going to look in terms of a path forward for the for left-wing members in the union or in the Labour Party for that matter? Yeah, Steve, I hope you can hear me now. I hope it's a bit better a connection off the phone. Uh, if yeah, I could just flip back for a second to the question on community, because I wouldn't want any community members who are watching to in any way think that Shah Graham was not committed to the community membership. They've been a vital part of her leverage campaigns, whatever she's been involved in leverage industrially. Clearly, whenever you're part of an election, you decide on an election message. And Sharon obviously decided on a message that was very clear about getting back into the workplace. That's where she was concentrating for her votes. And she went with a strategy to deliver her the win. But community members should not be fearful that they suddenly have a general secretary who's not supportive of community. Uh, she will be supportive of community. She's a fighting back individual and will want to fight back for deprived communities as much as she'll want to fight back for the workplace. On the Labour Party, I heard Neil's comments. Obviously, we find ourselves in an existential crisis with the Labour Party. For the very first time, we're moving in a direction where you can see socialism being exited. You can see an attack on good working people, good socialists, but you can also feel an attack on the trade union movement. Peter Mandelson came up with his comments about severing the link with the trade unions. Uh, Chulo wrote to Keir Starmer asking him to disown those comments and say publicly that Peter Mandelson had no right to say them and he did not said so, so, said any such thing. And then today, as, as Neil referenced, we have the fantastic individual that is Ian Hobson, and a committed socialist who has campaigned for trade union issues all of his life, for working class people all of his life. You could not get an individual who would want to be part of the Labour Party and part of the Labour movement any more so than Ian Hobson. And he receives a letter confirming that he's been auto expelled and the response of the Baker's Union is to say that their executive will be meeting at the very same time that Keir Starmer is making his election address to conference to discuss whether or not they disaffiliate from the Labour Party. So we have a moment of crisis right now and it's the reason why don't leave organised and I've been chairing this Steve but in a personal capacity I should say not in a capacity as AGS to Unite has brought together all of the left groupings and we have now agreed other than Momentum who I'm still hopeful will come on board. Momentum want their concentration at the moment to be on campaigns and organising but I've been at pains to say to them that no one thing should be the, the expense of another. So we have an alternative conference on the 18th of September called Labour Left and Socialism which all of the left groupings have signed up to. FBU has signed up to it as well. As, as the Bakers Union, we're hopeful that other left unions will come on board. We know that we have grassroots NEC members who are who are supportive. We hope that the SCG will come on board and I'll be addressing them whenever par Parliament returns. And that day of the 18th of September, Steve, which I can go through if you want me to as to how it's going to be formatted and on what subjects, but that is a statement of left unity. It is a statement of left defiance. It is a reaffirmation of socialism and it is saying very clearly to this horrendous leadership that socialism and trade unionism is here to stay and no matter what they think that they can do on our watch, we are not disappearing and it is us. So there's a voice for organised labour, us the voice for socialism, and there's us the voice for our communities. Absolutely. Good. Bonnie? Well, I mean, um, I was involved in the um, setup of Don't Leave Organised from the outset. It's been running for now close to two years. Um, and I'm really pleased that this massive conference is happening on the 18th. It's going to be an in-person and an online event. So it's going to be a hybrid, which is um, going to allow access to as many people as possible to get involved. We do need to put our heads together and we do need to come out with the right strategy to make sure we, we are back in power as soon as possible. Yes. I mean, a couple of you there mentioned the uh, the Bakers, the Unite um, 
the sorry the the um, labor situation then i mean i talked to ian hudson last week when the press first started reporting that he was going to get kicked out of the party and he hadn't heard anything about it it was news to him uh, and he was uh you know as far as i'm aware still hadn't up to a couple of days ago been informed about by the party that uh that they had any intentions uh, to uh, you know about removing him but obviously with his links to one of the proscribed groups then uh, you know it was fairly inevitable they're going to they were going to come after him but the uh his union the bakers have uh, responded to that today with a statement released saying they're going to be recalling their conference in order to hold a vote on whether they are going to remain affiliated to uh the labor party because they said that you know we 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 do, we stand up to bullies and we stand up to the bosses uh and we you know the labor party needs to learn that there will be consequences if it behaves like this um what what lessons in there then for how the other left affiliated unions should be uh, reacting to the labor party in order to try to keep uh you know keep some semblance of of sense and an actual labor identity within the labor party as it uh you know as it goes forward in its unfolding disaster as it is at the moment well steve uh, i mean the, the, the absurdity of this position is that the, the baker's union is one of the oldest affiliates to the labor party through all those years stuck with us thick and, through thick and thin and we get to a, a stage just now where you know i have to say you know and i don't say this just flippantly but i genuinely think we have the worst leaders the labor party has one of the worst we've ever had it's i, I thought i knew i um, had a relationship with keir starmer when i was in the scottish parliament because i was our brexit spokesperson in scotland and he did brexit in jeremy's cabinet and I actually had a fairly decent working relationship with him. Fairly decent working relationship with him. And I thought that when he came to lead, he would at least have Boris Johnson over a barrel every week in the House of Commons by using his legal skills and his attention to detail and all of that. And no matter all the other stuff that's went wrong, I am astonished that he can't even do that. It can't even do that. And it just is remarkable how badly he is performing as the leader of the party. And the polls, are, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember being told that any other leader apart from Jeremy Corbyn would, be, Corbyn would be 20 points ahead in the polls. Well, look at the polls now. The polls are absolutely woeful. And we've got the worst Tory leader since the last Tory leader. And yet we can't even... They take him on. It is just incredible how badly Labour is performing. And, you know, I, I, I just despair. And there has to come, there has to be a reckoning because there's no way that, the, the you know, the turkeys are going to allow Christmas to come uh, under the charge of uh, uh, Starmer by allowing him to continue until a general election. Then all the cheerleaders many of them wouldn't be there. Yes, Howard, I don't know if you caught the question there at the beginning, but uh, obviously we saw, uh, we've saw we seen the Bakers today announce that they're recalling their conference in order to uh, hold a vote on getting the um, potentially disaffiliating uh, the Bakers Union from, um, from the Labour Party altogether in response to what they said is, is bullying from the Labour Party and... and uh, nonsensical kind of uh, nonsensical stance and they said you know we stand up to the bosses we're going to stand up to the bullies in the Labour Party as well uh, and they're timing that uh, interestingly to take place at the same time as Keir Starmer's speech to um, no doubt to divide the uh, media attention he'll be hoping to get on his uh, supposed keynote speech um, what what lesson is there in that for the other Labour affiliated unions about how to uh, behave towards the current leadership do you think? Was that to me, Steve? Sorry. Yeah, that was to you, mate. Sorry, I'm popping back in and forward, so I don't know whether or not you got my last contribution, Steve. So do pull me up. My apologies in respect of it. Well, listen, I've been very firmly of the view in respect of this leadership that long has passed the time where you can expect to persuade them through reason uh, to adopt the socialist agenda. 
And long has passed the time where you can persuade him through reason that he's on the route to an electoral catastrophe. Obviously, we've seen the electoral defeats. He scrapes over the line in respect of one uh, one um, by-election, and suddenly that's hailed as if it's a victory for for socialism and labour. And we're all returning. The truth of the matter, obviously, is that we are heading towards an electoral disaster. We're heading towards a London-centric party of the establishment, one that is not too dissimilar to the Liberals, one that rejects organised labour. And now is the time for organised labour and the trade union movement to stand up. You can't expect to receive members' monies as a Labour Party leader if you're not going to follow an agenda that is going to improve the lives of working people. So the response from the Baker's Union is absolutely right. I'll just say in respect of prescription, which is obviously wholly wrong, but the idea that you can prescribe an organisation and then retrospectively say that someone must have supported the organisation now because they supported it two years Mm -hmm. ago. Well, on that basis, you wouldn't have any MP ever crossing the House of Commons because you wouldn't be able to accept anybody from an alternative party. It's absolute Mm -hmm. nonsense. It's completely incoherent. We all know what it's about. It's all about picking out those socialists that they think are vocal, that they think are articulate, they think challenge the leadership, and picking them off. And that's why, and I don't know how much you heard about the September the 18th conference, but that's why the left now has to come together in unity, has to come together as one voice, a statement of defiance, because it's only by way of standing up for our brothers and sisters who are being attacked that we ourselves will not be attacked going forward. There will be no voice for us by the time they come to us. There is the time right now to stand up fearlessly against this Labour leadership. And what the Bakers Union are doing is quite right, and I applaud them for it. Really well done. Um, so, well, that's my next question. But, um, you know, we've seen um, in Scotland, if I can come on to, to you, Neil, briefly on this. I mean, we, you know, in Scotland, we saw Labour go from the dominant party to virtually zero in, in you know, almost overnight. Uh, we've also seen, again, a, another example of the um, conduct of Keir Starmer and the disregard, I guess, for member democracy in the way that, you know, he had a meeting with some rich donors who said they didn't like Richard Leonard. So he then manoeuvred Richard Leonard out of the yeah. party. Now we're stuck with another centrist who, you know, they keep telling us he's going to be uh, going to be the next right thing and revitalise the party that's shown no signs of happening whatsoever. Um you know, what hope is there in Scotland and, and what lessons are there for us here in uh, the rest of us are all in England at the minute, um, you know, for for a party that, you know, that, that shows every side. I mean, Keir Starmer seems, to, from my view, to be showing every sign of trying to do in Scotland and Wales what he did uh, to the party. Uh, sorry, in England and Wales, what he did to the party in Scotland, certainly in Liverpool, where I live. I think it's a it's a real risk. Yeah, absolutely. It is. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you the answer. They have learned nothing from Scotland, absolutely nothing, and have been warned and warned and warned again to watch what happened to Labour in Scotland when you take the voters and your party members for uh, for granted and you have a disaster on your hands. In 1987, Labour had 50 Labour MPs in Scotland. We now have one, one. Even in Gordon Brown's time, we had 40-odd Labour MPs and we went down to one uh, uh, one Labour MP. It has been a disastrous time for Labour in Scotland. Uh, we have gone through leaders up here like you go through a pair of socks. Uh, you know, I think we've had nine since devolution and since 1999. Um, and, the, you know, changing the leader ain't, ain't, ain't the, the, the fix. What the fix is having policies in a programme that is attractive to voters, that resonates with people in working class communities, and that you can sell to the electorate as being a credible programme. And uh, that is that's been nowhere in Scotland for you know the last uh, two decades. And we have the the nationalists up here who I, I think historically, along with Sinn Fein, have been amongst the cleverest political parties in the uh, you know in their kind of electoral system. Uh, you know, who have gone from three seats to dominance uh, in Scotland. Um, they're all things to all people in the rural areas. They are, you know, effectively, you know, rural Tories and the urban constituencies. They pose as, as socialists. They, they certainly aren't. But 
Um, they quote they all as a nationalist. They they are all things to all people, and um, and it's uh, it, 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 there's a, a very very um, clear number of lessons for the Labour Party at a national level, none of which they've taken uh, and none of which they've listened to, despite a number of people, maybe in one of them, pleading with them to change their approach on the constitution, on a whole load of policy areas, um, but frankly, um, they haven't listened and uh, I just see the same mistakes being, being made. Uh, Howard, in the Unite um, preliminaries in the nominations phase, you were the pretty obvious favourite of all of the Celtic nations. I mean, what's your take on the uh, situation up in Scotland and, and how that refers to and applies to the, the what's unfolding here in England at the moment? Well, it is a reflection in the fact that the Labour Party is very London-centric and the idea that you can have a party in Scotland that has effectively been run from London is just a, a, an anathema to me. It's just a complete contradiction. You're supposed to be the party of devolution plus. You're supposed to be the party that moves the debate forward in respect to federalism. And there you are as a leader in London trying to be the leader of a whole of the United Kingdom. I think it's inevitable that, that Labour has to discuss its own structures. It has to discuss federalism as a party in order yep. to move forward, to then be able to get back into the communities. And I think if I was the leader of Labour, obviously I'm, I'm not going to be, but if I was the leader of Labour, I would be promoting that discussion right here now, because I think it's inevitable that the whole discussion around politics is going to move to federalism. We are yeah. seeing the success of mayors, regional mayors. We're seeing the success of of, uh, of devolution in, in Wales and to some extent in Scotland. We can say what we like about the SNP, but they're preferable to Boris Johnson and the Tories, that's okay. for sure. Yeah. And obviously they've had to adopt the socialist agenda in order to steal the votes of Labour. And we've seen obviously in Wales that there's been a better performing NHS. We've seen a better relationship with trade unions. I see regions of England asking for assemblies. I see mayors getting greater powers. I I see the whole structure moving towards federalism. I hope that Labour will lead the debate in respect of the abolition of the House of Lords, the election of a second assembly. I hope Labour will lead a debate on votes for 16-year-olds. I hope personally that Labour will lead a debate in respect of electoral reform generally across the board. And I hope also that they will lead a debate on the end of private education, because I do believe that private education is a political concept in the United Kingdom, one that drives elitism through journalism, through industry and through politics itself. So Labour right here and now, if it's going to speak for the nations, has to start speaking about these different structures and federalism and being ambitious, have some type of vision, man, May be able to put yourself forward as if you represent people and you understand their issues. Just be a human being would be a start right now. <laughs> Bonnie, That's you're true. way down there in the uh, in the smoke, but give us the give us the perspective from that end of the country on. Uh, yeah, so you know, on, on um, obviously, obviously, I completely agree with what the two guests have had to say. What we saw happen in Scotland was entirely predictable and devastating at the same time. But what we saw in London in the GLA elections last May was we saw an incumbent Labour mayor who, you know, there were a lot of issues with, let's put it that way, up against a Conservative candidate whose own party defunded him because he was so utterly helpless. Now, London's been a fairly... Um, secure socialist uh, city because there's lots of us working class people here and Labour, Labour have done very well for a while. But what we saw as the result of that election is that it was a very close run thing between the Labour incumbent and a Tory candidate, as I say, who, who didn't even in the end have the support of his own party. Now, this is complete. This is a red flag. This says that you know, in, a, in the circumstances that we've had at least 150,000 people die needlessly, we've lost Scotland, we've lost lots of seats in the north, we're, at we're in serious danger of losing London too. So as much as mm -hmm. Labour is London-centric at the moment, it's not London-centric for Londoners, it's London-centric mm -hmm. for those who have different, <laughs> different um, goals and ideals than most of us that live here do. One of the, I mean, I'm not, I'm half Scottish, uh, so I pay a decent amount of attention to the politics up there. And one of the things that, you know, made me see the writing on the wall, I guess, was the fact that, um, you know, the impact of 
uh, the the independence campaign, Scottish independence campaign, and the um, fact that you know Labour was campaigning essentially on the same platform with the Tories, yeah. and how utterly poisonous that was to our uh, fortunes in, I say our uh, to Labour's fortunes in Scotland, and um, you know, is it are we seeing you know Keir Starmer's now you know kind of taking this whole approach through the pandemic about you know wanting to be cooperative with Boris Johnson rather than confrontational, wanting to you know, get alongside him and, if anything, you know, push him harder into some of the, you know, mad decisions he's made. Um, no, not, so appearing, not appearing to be too too argumentative. And, you, you know, is, it, are we, is, is he doing the same thing in England now by uh, causing up to the Tories on a platform here, essentially, rather than, uh, you know, as, as, as Labour did in the... Uh, Steve, the decision, in Scot the decision in Scotland to join with the Tories on that Better Together campaign is the biggest political disaster to befall the Labour Party in Scotland ever and ever will be that i can ever think of it was catastrophic and there was many of us you know told them time and time again that this was a, a the road to disaster and it proved to be so they would not listen you cannot stand there and point at the class enemy for the entire duration of your history saying don't go near these bastards and then the next time you're standing, shaking hands with them, with your arm around them, saying, we're better together. It is. It was just unbelievably dreadful, even, uh, you know, practicalities, political strategy, the presentation, everything. Everything was disastrous about that, with a wholly predictable conclusion that um, will, will remain with us for a very long time yet. Yes. Um I've seen a couple of comments coming in from people arguing about, you know, that Scots want independence and not federalism, etc. So, I mean, how, what, what exactly is federalism? How would that work and why would... Steve, uh, I, I, you know, I would be delighted to come on your show and do a full show about federalism because it's something I've been involved in since uh, from when I was first elected to the Scottish Parliament. I would do that, no problem, and I'm happy to debate that with anyone. Um, you know, in and in a, in a few words... I believe that all powers should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament unless there's an overwhelming reason not to devolve some of those powers. And in some cases, there are overwhelming reasons not to devolve powers. I don't want I don't want powers that are going to make us worse off devolved. I want powers that are going to make us better off and make our communities stronger and make our people, you know, uh, our country stronger. But that's a whole debate that we need to have. Just a, a couple of sound bites. I don't want to do that. I have mm -hmm. respect, a great respect for people who take the alternative position for me on the Constitution in terms of independence. I, what I want in the, the, the independence uh, federalism debate is for that to be a respectful debate where we listen to each other this time instead of shouting and gobbing poison at each other, which happened the last time. So I am more than happy to come on with, with someone, another socialist who takes a, a, another point of view and have that debate. I would, In fact, I would warmly welcome it. Super. Now uh, we mustn't forget that you've got you've got a banner behind you, nice uh, orange have, yes. looks like that on the screen, yeah. uh, orange yep. or red, I can't tell. Yep. And um, with a with a very catchy looking title. So tell us a little bit about that because obviously I'm sure we'll end up coming full circle because your book will uh, tie into a lot of these issues that we've been discussing. So give us yes. a, give us a rundown on your book and what uh, what led you to write it and what you've put in it. Well, uh, uh, first of all, um, thanks for having us on to talk about it. It'll be out, uh, it's out now, um, and we're uh, formally launching it next week. So um, it's available. It's called If You Don't Run, They Can't Chase You. It's a quote from uh, Michael McGahey, who was the former uh, vice president of the NUM during the minor strike, and it was his plea to uh, working people not to run, but to, uh, because if you run, they'll just continue to chase you, but to turn around, to fight back, and to organise. And uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, quote from a from a fantastic man. And I was very honoured that Michael's uh, family. I asked them if I could use the quote, and I was very honoured that they, they they allowed that to happen. I would never have used it if they were unhappy with it. Um, if I go back to the financial crisis, post financial crisis, we saw the catastrophe of austerity inflicted on communities. We saw the the you know the big companies, the Amazons, the Starbucks, the RBSs, Lehman Brothers, all of these characters fleecing uh, ordinary people. We saw unemployment uh, increase across Europe, youth unemployment, huge uh, numbers of youth, young people unemployed. We saw the Troika come in and write the uh, economic policy of Greece and 
uh, and Ireland and, you know, all of these things happen. And you would have thought at that point that the left would have then come to the fore across Europe. People would have rejected neoliberalism. neoliberalism. They would have seen the error of their ways and thinking that that was the, the way in which to build a cohesive uh, society and that the left would have taken uh, power across Europe. Um, but that the opposite happened. The right came forward. The right organised, and you know, uh, only in you know maybe you know we had Saritza for a, a short time in Greece. We had we eventually got um, socialist governments in Spain and Portugal. But generally, it was forces of the right, most grotesquely in the form of Trump in the US. And and so, and and if we look at what happened in the UK, we saw the Corbyn project. That, you know. Jeremy, a great friend of mine, was heavily involved in two of his campaigns, chaired them in Scotland. But we we saw the 2017 election, that result, denying the Tories a majority. And then the establishment swooped, fearing that there could be a Labour a socialist government. And they swooped and organised, and they unleashed the hounds of hell on anybody, uh, on Corbyn and anyone associated with them to ensure there was never going to be that government. Now, we go up to the present day with war and conflict and inequality and injustice. It would be the most easy thing in the world for us to despair so much that you just chuck in the towel and walk away. But we can't do that. We simply cannot do that. We cannot allow the forces of the right, the forces of the establishment to basically dominate our society and dominate uh, our economy and keep us in our place as they see it. And what I wanted to do was look at some of the inspiring campaigns that have happened over the last 50 years and how people have organised. People have not laid down. They've not ran, as McGaffey said. They've turned around, they've faced up and they've organised. So I brought together, uh, I've brought together 16 different chapters of people across a wide range of um, campaigns. And I interviewed them just as and when I met them and, and arranged it over a number of years to speak to them about the campaigns that they were involved in, how those campaigns developed, um, asking them about how they became involved in politics, so their, their, their background, and then how the campaigns developed, and then some of the tactics they used and their experience. And I have to say, it was a fascinating uh, time speaking to some of these abs my working title was heroes because they are my heroes I, I i say that unequivocally many of them would not accept the title hero they would not accept it you know if i said to dennis skinner you're a hero he'd probably punch me but uh mm -hmm. you know uh but if i if i look at some of the chapters you know uh, it goes right from uh, way back in the um 19th early 70s the scottish daily news which is a workers cooperative taking over the what was the daily express then Workers' cooperatives set up, and then Robert Maxwell came in. Remember him, who stole the pensions and was a, a you know a fraudster. And this was a battle between the workers' cooperative and Maxwell. And my friend Alistair Mack, who's a man in his nineties now, told told me the story and recalled the story. Absolutely brilliant stuff about workers taking control of a newspaper, only for it to be their dream to be destroyed by Maxwell and others. But it's a very interesting uh, campaign. And then if we go forward with things like the Hillsborough campaign, you know, I, I can't believe the, can't, I can't um, get across the emotion uh, that was in the conversation I had with Margaret Aspinall, whose son died at Hillsborough. It was just, it was just so moving and I, I will never forget it. Um, look how long they campaigned for justice. Look how long it took them to get the result, but they never gave up because they knew that right was on their side. The blacklisting campaign, Dave Smith, a working class hero of the highest order, fantastic man. Dave organising uh, blacklisted workers, proving a very active establishment conspiracy against ordinary construction workers. I'm a bricklayer to trade. This was this was the people that you know that were around me in building sites that they were blacklisting because they had the audacity to ask for fair treatment at work. They asked for uh, health, good health and safety. Uh, at work. And we go forward with, I've got other campaigns in there like women's rights campaigns, Maria Fife who was an MP in Scotland who was one actually one of the first people to 
raised the issue of whitelisting in the House of Commons. Maria talking about her camp. She was, when I mentioned those 50 Labour MPs in Scotland, Maria was the only woman elected out of 50. And she was a, 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 an absolute like, um, stalwart of demanding rights for women and more representation for women. Um, the, the Shrewsbury campaign. The Shrewsbury campaign, it took 50 years for them, almost 50 years for them to have their uh, their campaign, uh, their, their uh, convictions quashed. Dogged determination to prove that they were right and uh, absolutely phenomenal uh, speaking to Terry Renshaw, one of the campaigners. If we go forward, I, um, I spoke to um, at Louise Adamson, who, whose brother was an electrician and who um, was elect electrocuted at work on a job that had it was a, sho a shop, a shop that had to be open, open the following day, and uh, and he was electrocuted because there was um, they were um, taking risks with health and safety. The, the employer was Louise became and is now an international campaigner for health and safety. She is a wonderful and tells her brother's story. Uh, which must be so uh, um, sore for her every time she has to tell that story. The Liverpool Dockers, who could forget that campaign? Tony Nelson, what a, what a guy, uh, talking about a three-year campaign on the docks at Liverpool. Imagine you know, having to keep that up. Um, and the Spy Cops, the Spy Cops uh, story, which is just, when you tell people who don't know anything about it, they look at Zoe as though you're some sort of conspiracy theorist. When you tell them that undercover police officers were infiltrating women, having intimate relationships with them, having children with them, when they were using the identity of dead children to pass themselves off as someone else, and you know, I think, uh, I think those women are right to say that they felt raped by the state because they were having an intimate relationship with someone who wasn't who they claimed they were. I mean, you know, it just blows you away. But these are these are and, and other eyes uh, involved in Scotland in the the issue around um, transvaginal mesh women who were implanted mm. by mesh implants that destroyed their lives. These women who were um, who were uh, disabled and chronic pain, uh, you know, lost their jobs. Some of them lost their homes. They were in no no real position to start organising a very energetic campaign because of the 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 ill health that they had, but they did. They bloody did because they wanted to see justice, and they want the, the biggest thing that drove them. They didn't want to see one other woman maimed like they were. They weren't doing it for themselves. They were doing it because it would help others. So there's a that's a kind of potted look at some of the campaigns. They are truly inspiring. Uh, I, I you know I, I don't care if people buy it or not. I, I really don't. I, I'm just it has been so fulfilling personally doing it. And the, the things that I have learned, I also interviewed two people. Uh, I interviewed Dennis Skinner because of his role in the minor strike and the, the political role he played. And I also interviewed um, Alec Bennett, who was a minor during that time, to get the perspective from a minor and, and from the politician on the strike. And uh, I have to say, Dennis, uh, um, uh, my interview with him was very uh, important because Dennis is a tough guy. And it's the first time I've seen him really emotional about and that was because he was recalling what went on at that time he did 300 meetings personally in a year on that during that strike 300 it's just phenomenal and another one Howard I'll, I'll speak about is Mark Lyon at uh, uh, Unite in Scotland Mark who was the union convener at Grangemouth when there was the uh, dispute with Ineos one of the most powerful companies in the world and Mark was I interviewed Mark, and I have to say, he changed before my eyes. Mark's a very chirpy, you know, guy, and he actually changed, his colour changed and everything before my eyes, recalling the pain that his family and his friends were put through by Ineos and by the pressures that they brought on him uh, during that, uh, that campaign. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it really is, it was quite, difficult for a number of people recalling the different campaigns that they were involved in because people are so immersed in this. They are absolutely immersed in it. They have a, a, a drive because they believe in justice. And that is the, the absolute theme of the book. People with a determined drive for justice. 
and uh, they are heroes, I have to say. Very good. Uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. Uh, we just had a question in there from uh, Ems saying, will this be available on audiobook? Are there plans for it to... Uh... I hope so. One of the issues with the audiobook, I think, is it would it would be so much better in the voice of the people who who gave the, the accounts to me. And when I was interviewing them, I tried to keep my input as, as minimal as possible because I wanted it in their, their words, their view, their style of speaking. Um, so if, if it was an audio book and just me reading the book, it would be, I have to say, it would be pretty crap. Um, if it was an audio book of them recalling their story, it would be so much better. But I do have the, the voice recordings of every interview. So I might I might try and do something where we post the interviews online because it's it's just so much better hearing it from them uh, personally and in their, their own voice and their own style and their own accent uh, is so much better. There's an idea. I think Howard should narrate the audio book. <laughs> Has he got a chapter? If not, just slate him in for the uh, slate him in for the follow up. And where can where can people get this? And in what so way? it's it's available from. My, I've got a, a website myself set up, neilfinleybooks.com, and my other two. I've got another two books on that, neilfinleybooks.com. But it will also be out from Worth Press in Scotland, uh, which is a national um, bookseller. So it'll be out in both, and I'm sure it'll be in usual outlets and stuff like that. But um, yeah, you can order it. Um, Newfoundlandbooks.com is kind of the easiest one just now until it all gets out in circulation. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope that people. I was speaking to John McDonald the other day, and John was uh, very complimentary about it. He his his bottom line was that throughout all of this desperate times, it gives people hope. It gives people hope because if you look. At some of the campaigns, some of these resulted in huge victories, massive victories, and some of them ended up in crushing defeats. But it all tells us something about the human spirit, about people's dignity, about their how, how much people value a sense of fairness and justice, how people see equality, uh, and how people just will refuse to be beaten no matter the powerful forces against them. And that's a huge lesson for us, I think. If I, if I look at those women who were uh, involved in the MESH campaign. They were fighting not just the government in Scotland. This became an international campaign. It's a massive issue across the globe. They And it, and it kind of started off with women in Scotland, real, one or two women talking to each other and realising that they had the mm. same medical product inside them. And they then started to have pressure from not just the government, they had the regulator telling them that it was all in their head, they had their clinicians telling them it was all imaginary. You know, this was the gold standard procedure that they had. They had international, you know, um, what would it be, uh, groups of um, the most senior pelvic surgeons saying, you know, this is this is the way, this is the best treatment you can have. And they refused, they refused to believe any of this because they knew inside their body the damage that was being done and they were determined. And they have been proven, absolutely proven to be correct. So I think it's about, um, I hope people will be inspired by the by the, the, the contributions that people have made. Um, and I certainly have been. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm pleased I did it. And I think there'll be, I think there'll be, a, I definitely think there'll be a volume too, because there's there's so many other campaigns out there that, that people we want people to know about, and one one of the, sorry one of the other motivations, Steve, about why I did it was, I think there's real uh, opportunity for some intergenerational learning in this. So we have a lot of young people coming into campaigning, whether it be through the environment, um, it could be the independence movement in Scotland, it could have been Brexit, it could be a million and one things. And I, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that oh, this is not meant to sound patronising. I know some people might take it as that. But kind of some think they, they're inventing campaigning and it's just that it's all this is, you know, they're kind of, it's a new thing and they, they've realised how to campaign. And I think they need to, in some instances, learn from these types of campaigns that have gone on in the past, learn how um, people got secured those victories, also learn when people were defeated and why they were defeated. But there's also learning the other way and that old fogies like us can look at these young people and say, well, they're applying new modern campaigning methods to old traditional principles and actions. And actually, if we bring the two together, we actually can create another world, a better world. 
and uh, in a fairer and more equal society. So I hope there's a bit of two-way learning in this as well. Mm. Very good. Uh, so it's a physical book rather than e-book at the moment, or at the moment, yes. I think it will come out in e-book in due course. Yeah, yeah. And the price? Uh, Nine ninety-nine. Nine ninety-nine. Cheap at half the price. And that was neilfinleybooks.com, did you say? Yes, yes. Brilliant. And so, uh, oh, so, sorry, Steve, I'll say one more thing. If any, anybody wants um, me to do a piece on uh, around this at their union branch, at their sort of left forum, God, even their CLP, um, I'm more than happy to do that because there is a kind of, um, I think there is a bit of, people are a bit, you know, a bit pissed off with nothing much happening and actually enthusing people with a bit of we, we, we sort of stories of positive results, brilliant campaigns, inspirational people is maybe just what we're needing at the moment. So I'm more than happy to do that and I can provide them, um, you know, if MD needed a bulk order or anything like that, we can do a good good price on a bulk order. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've uh, seen a few people there. I think hope is the big, the big thing missing at the moment. That was what yeah. got people so excited about Howard's campaign. There was some hope about it. Yeah. Um, Bonnie, are you happy to uh, give us your thoughts for the last couple of minutes before we uh, run up to the end of the show? Yeah, I mean, hope is so important. We've come a long way in our movement. We've made a lot of gains, um, but there are a lot, lots more that we still need to fight for, and lots more that we still need to win. Um, I think it's so important that people are involved in their trade union and they're encouraging the trade union that they belong to to advocate for them. Um, I think if we sit and wait for Westminster to get behind us and start supporting us in the current climate, it's unlikely to happen from anywhere. But I'm also reminded of where we were as, as socialists and trade unionists a little over 100 years ago when um, it was the Conservatives and the Liberals. And we're in a position now where, you know, I'm not sure that the current Labour Party is a million miles away from the Liberal Party of old, not the Lib Dems, but the original <laughs> Liberal Party. Mm. So we've got a lot of work to do and we can, in, we can get hope in people, we can inspire people. That's what Jeremy Corbyn's campaigns did. That's what Howard's campaign did. We need to carry on believing that we can build better for the next generation. Very good. Uh, Everybody who's watching, I would like to thank you for um, giving us your time. If you've watched all the way through, even more so. If you're watching this on Catch Up again, thank you. Uh, big thanks to our guests who uh, have no doubt had uh, hectic days in their own right and uh, have made time to join us tonight uh, for what I think has been, in, in spite of a few technical hitches, a very uh, stimulating and, and challenging discussion. Uh, I like your comment there, Bonnie, about the Liberals, because I think you know it's interesting that uh, the formation of the Labour Party came really at that point and uh you know the Becker's union might disaffiliate who knows they they they, they funded the beginning of one party they just it's possible they could end up funding the beginning of another one who knows um yep. but you know let's let's hope there's still hope for labor because uh you know we shouldn't we shouldn't cede that ground easily to the uh, right wing have been uh you know doing everything they can to nick it essentially um, Come so along to the conference on the 18th of September people you oh yeah 18th of September is that heard. Yes, uh, and watch out for the Baker's vote then, uh, which is likely to be happening at the same time that Keir Starmer is doing his uh, doing his conference speech. Because uh, yeah, I know which one I'd find more stimulating to watch. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. We're right on time. I uh, wish you a good rest of the week and keep a, a close eye out for the rest of our output uh, on Socialist Telly coming forward. Have a lovely rest of the week. A lovely evening, everyone. Take care. Good night. Cheers. Good night, folks. <laughs>